Welcome to South Dakota Specialty Producers podcast series, Fresh Bites. I'm your host, Laura Kaler with SDSPA. The South Dakota Specialty Producers Association is made up of growers, consumers, and others interested in producing, marketing, and supporting South Dakota specialty crops, meats, and locally made products. In a rural location, an ideal market for producers to connect with are school lunch programs. This can serve as a win-win for the schools to have a supply of fresh foods and for producers to have a nearby market. Joining us today, Teresa Wimmerslog of Iowa State University Extension is sharing with us how Iowa has set up food hubs to serve local schools and other wholesale customers. Teresa played a role in starting the, the Iowa Food Hub in the northeast corner of the state and continues to be involved with the Iowa Food Hub Managers Working Group, as well as working to help schools to develop procurement and use plans to make the implementation of local food successful long term. Thanks for being with us today, Teresa. You have a wealth of knowledge on this topic, and I'm excited to share that with the individuals looking into growing farm to school in their own communities. For those less familiar with farm to school, can you briefly summarize what purchasing from local producers can look like for a school? Absolutely. I'm glad to be able to join you today. Um, Schools can buy directly from farms or from what we call intermediary markets, like food hubs or distributors. In Iowa, most schools are using what we call the micro-purchase procurement option and buy either directly from farms or through food hubs. And that split right now is about 50-50, half and half. Obviously, most produce is purchased in the fall with purchases of storage crops and greenhouse crops continuing through the year. Iowa schools also serve local yogurt and cheese curds pretty regularly. I'm in the Northeast corner next to Wisconsin, so cheese curds are a big deal. A few schools have special grilling days in the fall and spring where local cattlemen will grill local burgers for the schools. We spent a lot of time early on working with the schools to identify products that are affordable for them because we all know that school meals are pretty price sensitive. Our top 10 list includes things like apples, melons, peppers, cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, summer squash, winter squash, beets, carrots, and cabbage. Many times we can offer number two quality products for an even better price, and that works great for food service. That sounds like some wonderful food, and I'm especially glad to hear the kids are getting cheese curds in school. Can you describe what types of structures exist for food hubs working with the schools? This is pretty generic information on food hubs. Um, we All across the country, there's food hubs popping up all over. They come in many forms and like farms, they're all different. In general, food hubs will fall into three business models. Some will be retail only, so they're more of a direct consumer model, like a grocery store or a buying club. Um, Some food hubs are a wholesale model where they want to sell to schools or sell to grocery stores or bigger accounts. And some of them are a mix um, where they'll do a little bit of retail and a little bit of wholesale. Um, We have a mix of all those models in Iowa. The wholesale hubs are usually the ones serving the schools and colleges. There's so there's the, the model type, but then there's also the legal structure piece. And the most common legal structures that you'll see for food hubs are the for-profits. So they will be the LLCs, the sole proprietorships or corporations. Then there's the nonprofit or the public um, food hubs where they'll actually be 501c3 organizations. And then there's um, definitely food hubs that'll be cooperatives where they'll form under that cooperative model and it'd be a group of farmers working together. Again, in Iowa, we have a mix of models or legal structures. Um, The nonprofit model provides more opportunities to apply for grants and to ask for donations from the community. And those wholesale food hubs that we see serving schools tend to rely more on the grant funding and um, the donation line in order to support that farm to school market, which tends to be a tighter margin market. Realizing that there's a lot of different types of food hubs set up and each is going to differ a bit. From a producer's perspective, what is the advantage for them to participate in a food hub? And what are some things that they should consider before they decide to jump on board with that? That's a really great question. And, you know, every farm is going to have to make that decision of what works best for them. 
Some people see food hubs as another middleman in the supply chain. And sometimes that middleman can be a bad word. Um, I really view food hubs as being supply chain partners. I would prefer to see our small farms and their, the farmers staying on their farm, growing food and producing food. And the food hub can take care of the selling coordination and delivery. To really see the value, I think it's helpful to look from the customer perspective. Since food hubs work with a number of producers, they're able to offer a variety of source verified local products. They, they will vet all their farmers for food safety and product quality. They provide a streamlined ordering process and payment process for the customer. They provide delivery to that customer. They can aggregate the necessary quantity for larger schools and they can help access multiple farms in order to achieve more consistent availability. We know that, you know, if we have consistent orders for eight cases of cucumbers every week, that's a lot of pressure to put on one farm. But if we have two or three farms helping to fill that order, then we can provide um, more customer satisfaction. Now, from that school perspective, and really it's any customer perspective, but if a farmer decides to work with a food hub to service schools, those schools are going to expect farmers to provide clean product in new boxes. They expect farmers to carry liability insurance and have some type of food safety training. The farmers will need to have a labeling and traceability system and be able to provide invoices at the time of delivery. The schools and the hubs will expect farmers to be upfront about product issues or shortages. They know things happen and the farmer should be easy to contact, which me usually means having a phone number or email where messages can be collected and returned right away. Thanks, Teresa. Those are some really good considerations for producers and for the hubs. So as the Iowa Food Hub was developed, that's the one that you were pretty involved with helping start. Can you describe how the Iowa Food Hub was initiated and how the format of the hub has evolved over time? Absolutely. You know, Iowa Food Hub actually started back in 2019 or 2009 as a grant project in the rural area. So we've got over 10 years of trying to figure out how do we aggregate product to service. And that, at that time, the college, the local college was the big customer. Um, they had no startup funds. You know, they weren't a private enterprise where they could go to the bank and ask for money. Um, food hubs were pretty new with the model and um, how do you put together a business plan. So they started as a subscription worksite food box program where they aggregated produce, dairy, and meat into boxes to some larger employers that were, say, down in the metro areas, um, down from uh, me means south. So we're in the northeast corner of Iowa, and all the people live 100 miles to the south <laughs> in Dubuque, Cedar Rapids, Des Moines areas, Iowa City. So we know we have to move our food um, to those areas in order to find customers. So at one point, because it was a worksite program, the customers pay for all that product up front and then it gets delivered. So we didn't really have cash flow issues. We had money to work with and to continue to provide the service. At one point, they had over 200 boxes. Once there was enough product moving to those metro areas every week, um, that those products, those boxes paid for the delivery. So our coordinator started looking at how do we start building on some wholesale, how do we start building the wholesale, wholesale side of the business? So within five years, that wholesale side of the business became the dominant side and the retail side started to shrink. But we were able to do that because that retail side provided that initial cash. At its largest point, the Iowa Food Hub had two full-time employees and two part-time drivers and sold over $850,000 per year. Um, in 2019, that was a bad year. Um, they had to go through a major reorganization and rescale their business. Now today, it has one part-time coordinator and four anchor buyers who buy product every week. Those anchor buyers are three school districts and the college. And it did $250,000 in sales in 2021. That's a wonderful example, though, of how you don't have to have a lot of funds to get started and how you grew substantially 
what's the scale of the hub today as far as how many people you're working with? The great thing, I mean, even with our big reorganization that we had to do, we continue to work with the same group of farmers. They completely understood the change that had to be made. And so we were able to keep most of them through the transition. Um, right now, the Food Hub has about 15 school accounts and about 20 other customers, mainly small grocery stores and restaurants. Um, they work with over 50 different producers and they sell everything. <laughs> Produce, eggs, dairy, honey, meat, flour, and lots of other value-added products. That's great that you can find a spot for all of those producers. What system do you guys use to figure out that balance between the quantity that the customer wants and then fulfilling that request? Yeah, so specifically looking at schools, and like I said earlier, we did a lot of planning with them to help figure out how to incorporate more local foods on their menus. It's important to remember that schools do their menus a month ahead. So um, what we, I guess, what I like to say is we train them that after they plan their menu for the month, they'll actually send a draft order to the food hub. So the food hub coordinator can start thinking about, oh, well, these are the quantities I need to be looking for and um, farmers I need to contact in order to meet this demand. Um, it's really neat now to see that the relationship with those schools is to the point where our school can say, you know, I wish I'm looking for something like this. Can you get me this? And the food hub coordinator will go out and find that product for them. So having that relationship um, just reemphasizes how important those local re and community based businesses are. Do you guys ever have issues with inconsistent or poor quality of produce? I imagine that different years, some Producers might have problems with pests and things like that. How do you guys address issues with quality? Well, we're pretty lucky in that we have wholesale growers that know their stuff. So those instances are pretty rare, but that doesn't mean that we don't have issues like frozen lettuce in January. <laughs> um, it's really hard to ship stuff on a truck that's supposed to be at 35 degrees and it's minus 35 degrees. Um, the Food Hub has a system for corrective actions, and we work with the customers and the producers to make things right. Um, for some of the smaller producers, you know, they are the newer ones, the beginning farmers. They're the ones still learning about entering into that wholesale market. So we'll tend to move more of their product into the smaller grocery store chains so that um, they can continue to learn and develop products that'll work for that market. As the aggregator, what is typically seen as a food hub's role in assuring that the producers are following food safety laws and processes? Yeah, at Iowa Food Hub, um, every new produce farm has a farm visit before the first purchase. We do not require GAP certification for our produce farms, but we do expect them to have food safety protocols in place, have food safety training, do water testing. Um, every other vendor, the meat vendors, the egg vendors, our bakers, um, they need to provide the appropriate licensing and insurance um, before they can sell to the hub. Um, my, I work for Extension, so one of my specialties is um, on-farm food safety. So I'll also provide training opportunities for farms as they need them in order to be able to um, help them with their efforts on their farm. With Extension, you are also involved with the Iowa Food Hub Managers Group, correct? Yes. Can you talk about what that group is and how it contributes to the success of all of the food hubs in Iowa? Yeah, the Food Hub Manager Working Group is really neat in that um, it started as a support group of the different food hubs in the state. Um, and they've been meeting now for almost six, seven years. Um, today, there are eight hubs in the group. Some of them are retail hubs. Some of them are wholesale hubs. Um, but, you know, our attendance is still really steady with everybody who attends. They meet every other week now by Zoom to vent <laughs> and support each other, um, troubleshoot common questions, um, work through some issues that they're seeing. Um, we're fortunate in that their geographies are different enough. Everybody's serving a different enough area that they really don't see each other as competitors. Um, they see that the potential market 
for local foods is huge. And right now we just all need to work together to continue to grow. Do they ever collaborate on projects together? Oh, absolutely. Um, we, they recently just received funding from um, some emergency specialty crop block grants to create what we're calling a hub to hub project. Um, we're seeing that there are farms in, other, in parts of the state that still have product, but it's hard to get that product to the other hubs to sell. So this project will create um, a consistent weekly delivery route, delivery and pickup route, so that um, we can move those products between the hubs so that they can continue to have strong sales during the winter months. That'll be a three-year project. It'll be, and we're just getting started. So um, there's gonna be a lot to learn on that one. Sounds like the managers group really helps with ensuring that success and having that support to lean on for the managers. From the school side, you also work quite a bit with helping the schools develop plans for implementing the local food. What are some things that a school can do to succeed long-term with purchasing through a hub and using local foods? Yeah, the biggest thing a school can do is just make sure that they're incorporating food into their menu. I keep telling schools that it's important to create a plan in order to do that. Otherwise, it just ends up being, you know, off the cuff orders and there's no real strategy behind it. Um, So we have another program in the state where we've trained some of our local food specialists to be um, farm to school procurement coaches. And those coaches will help the schools create a local food procurement plan so that they can ultimately get to that goal of serving something local every week throughout the school year. Um, And, you know, it's definitely incremental. You don't jump to that spot right away. Um, It takes several years to get to the point where they're making substantial procurement purchases. But I found in my experience, you really need to have that plan in order to make sure that um, the food system can build up around that market. For a new school just starting out in this, what are some products that are easy for them to put into that plan? Yeah, so I talked about those top 10, and those are always the ones that I go back to. The apples, the watermelons, um, cherry tomatoes, because not only are they affordable and readily should be readily available, um, but they're, they require minimum prep in order to serve them. So there's not a lot of, you don't have to think of recipes and, you know, different ways to serve them. You put the apple or you put the melon slice on the tray and the kids enjoy it. What are some other things that you can see as instrumental in boosting farm to school success? One of the things that um, we know needs to happen more in our state, and it's fun to watch the surrounding states work on this as well, is that incentive for local purchases. Something like a 10 cent a meal program or mini grants to schools in order to boost their local food purchases. In Iowa in 2020, we had a program called the Local Produce and Protein Program. Um, The governor used emergency CARES funding in order to provide mini grants to schools. At that time, it was $2,000 per school building that um, schools could use to make purchases. And over $225,000 was funneled through into the food system with that program. Um, Half of those purchases went through food hubs. So we know that that was very important. Now, a year later, we did some reflection in the food hub managers working group We started hearing that school food sales were down. We knew there wasn't funding in 21 for those purchases. And sure enough, once those incentives disappeared, the purchasing decreased. So I think it's the same story. We hear similar stories all across the country of, you know, the incentives are really important to get schools interested in buying food, but we need time to build that procurement planning build that system so that they can become established buyers and continue to make an impact. What are some resources for schools outside of Iowa that don't have you that they can use to develop a procurement plan? So our coaching program is based off of the USDA's local food purchasing project. So there is a bulletin out there that talks about how to walk through all those steps um, to create a procurement plan.
If there's someone listening to this podcast today who's inspired to start working on aggregating local foods for schools in their area, what would you advise them as the first step to take? Local food into schools is it's so there's a lot of passionate people in order that want to make that happen, but there's so many moving parts that my best advice is just start small, start thinking about how can we get apples into schools? And then the next step would be, how can we get cucumbers into schools? What does that look like? Um, on the food service side, they have procurement rules that they need to follow. So we have to give them time to figure out how they can um, put the pieces into place that they need to make it work. Um, but starting small with those easy projects, um, those you know one-time or two-time purchases is definitely the way to go and continue to grow. Thank you so much for sharing all of your advice and ideas for getting this started. You make it sound very doable. And like you say, start small and watch it grow with success, hopefully. Thank you very much for your time today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in to the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association podcast. We will be bringing you more episodes on aggregation for specialty crops. So don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, keep growing.